Newspapers began reporting on the total solar eclipse months ahead of time, providing advice about the best places to go if you wanted to be in the path of totality. Scientists prepared their experiments, people prepared their travel plans, businesses prepared for a bonanza, and everybody was searching for a piece of glass that they could look through without going blind. The biggest concern, of course, was the weather. The one thing that, aside from the sun and the moon, people couldn't control. And as events began to unfold, the entire nation seemed to drop whatever it was doing and look to the sky. It was eclipse mania on June 8th, 1918. It's really not fair to call a total solar eclipse a once-in-a-lifetime event. I mean, heck, we had one visible in the continental United States in 2017, and where I live in southern Illinois, we are very near the path of totality for both. And of course, there's a good chance that many people viewing the eclipse today will still be alive in 2044, the next time that a total solar eclipse will be viewable in the United States, although that'll require a trip to the plains of Montana or North Dakota. In fact, if you have the means and will to travel to them, total solar eclipses are viewable somewhere on Earth around every 18 months, although the viewing experience varies in the width of the path of totality and the length of totality, depending upon the distance to the moon. NASA notes, for example, that about 12 million people lived in the path of totality in 2017, while more than 31 million live in the path of totality of the 2024 eclipse. And while they might be relatively more common than, say, an earthquake in New York, eclipses are still perceived as being very rare, so much so that they tend to garner a great deal of excitement. People in 1918 were given plenty of lead time to think about the solar eclipse of June 8th. The Spokane Daily Chronicle, for example, reported on January 1st that the large telescope at Gonzaga University is to be placed on June 8th where the public can have free access to it for the benefit of those who wish to get a close-up view of the eclipse of the sun. The Tulsa Morning News showed a bit more excitement on the first day of the year. The eighth day of next June is to be a gala day for astronomers. On that day, the sun will be in total eclipse throughout a belt of 190 miles wide, extending across the United States. For many years, the news writes, every eclipse of the sun has been an event of widespread interest. But never was an eclipse awaited with such interest as that now approaching. The paper noted how times had changed. In olden times, an eclipse was the signal for superstition to run riot. A long time ago, the cause was unknown, so the coming of an eclipse was accompanied by weird rites, supplications of heaven, and fears seized upon by people to such an extent that they believed that the end of the world had come. Not so, however, in 1918, the news wrote, moving picture companies are making preparations to photograph every phase of the eclipse. Astronomers were gathered from all parts of the earth to watch it. Still, they write, no one can behold an eclipse without a feeling of awe. The eclipse was so important that notices of it appeared on the first day of the year in both the appropriately named Battle Creek Moon Journal and the Lewiston, Maine Sun Journal, which noted that unquestionably the most important astronomical event of the year will be the total eclipse of the sun, which will occur on June 8th. These notices are particularly notable as neither Michigan nor Maine were in the path of the eclipse. Perhaps they were imagining a visit to the telescope in Spokane. Obviously, part of the excitement was among scientists. The Champaign, Illinois Daily News opined that total solar eclipses have never been adequately described. Now astronomers use a camera to catch what the human eye cannot see. The photographs taken on Saturday's eclipse will actually be the most marvelous moving picture ever staged in the solar system. The Morning News reported that some scientists expect to discover some hitherto hidden secrets of the skies as a direct result. From every mountain peak in the belt of the eclipse, powerful cameras and telescopes are to take note of its program. Among those was Professor D.W. Morehouse of Drake University, who, according to the May 19th issue of the Des Moines Register, was traveling some 800 miles from Des Moines, Iowa to Matheson, Colorado, in hopes of getting a good picture with the big university telescope with photographic attachment. The cost of sending the good professor and telescope was reportedly between $500 and $600. That shouldn't surprise any of us today. The University of Washington announced on April 4th that they are sending five graduate students to somewhere along the border between Arkansas and Oklahoma, carrying a special telescope that allows us to observe the sun in a single wavelength of hydrogen. 
Not to be outdone, the Bulgarian news agency reported the same day that a team of Bulgarian scientists had already left for Mexico to observe the eclipse. Professor Penchko Markashiki of the Bulgarian Academy of Scientists said that observers carried with them a number of apparatus and equipment, carefully prepared months before the phenomenon itself. While it's clear that scientists today reacted to an eclipse much the same way that they did in 1918, Bulgarian scientists were unlikely to do so in 1918 when, as one of the Central Powers, they would have been at war with the United States. There was a specific bit of science that they were hoping to accomplish in 1918, however. In 1911, Albert Einstein had presented a paper entitled On the Influence of Gravitation on the Propagation of Light, that posited a different theory than the Newtonian explanation of gravity. At the time, Einstein and his theory were little known, but a colleague, Erwin Freundlich, sought to test Einstein's theory by observing a solar eclipse. With the sun momentarily dimmed by the eclipse, scientists could observe the gravitational deflection of starlight passing near the sun. He asked Charles Perrin, director of the Argentine National Observatory, to include observation of light deflection in his observation of the solar eclipse of April 17, 1912. They readied the appropriate equipment, but observation was foiled by torrential rain. For the 21 August 1914 eclipse, both Freundlich and Perrin led expeditions to Crimea to test light deflection, as well as a third team from the United States. Unfortunately, the war started before the eclipse came, and Frendlich was detained, and his team were interned by the Russians. The Argentine and American team also failed, however, as clouds prevented the necessary observations. The American team was forced to abandon their equipment in Russia in the effort to escape the war zone. In 1918, Ethan Siegel writes in a 2017 edition of Forbes magazine, a team of physicists were sent by the U.S. Naval Observatory to observe the eclipse, where its duration would overland be the greatest at Baker City in Oregon. Would the still obscure Professor Einstein's theory finally be tested? It was not, of course, only scientists who were traveling to see the eclipse. The Nashville Banner wrote on May 26 that if the reader is so situated that he can travel within the shadow path of the present eclipse, he will never regret having made a special effort to do so. And it seems like people feel the same way today, 116 years later. Just yesterday, ABC Chicago reported that between 100,000 and 200,000 people will be traveling to my neck of the woods in southern Illinois in order to travel within the shadow of the present eclipse. And many made that special effort in 1918. The Spokesman Review reported that people flocked to roofs to watch the spectacle. The old National Bank threw open the roof of its building and stationed an employee there to look after the crowd. The bank had several hundred guests during the afternoon. The Davenport Hotel also had several hundred on its roof. The hurricane deck of the Kirtaline Hotel and the roof of the Petticord Hotel were also used by guests. The Oregon Daily Journal wrote that many thousands have made the trip to Woodland, Washington to view the eclipse, where the moon stealthily stole across the face of the sun and giver of all life on Earth. While in Portland, nearly 99% of the totality of the eclipse was visible to the thousands who lined the streets and roadways, leaned from windows, and stood in doorway vantage points. River Resorts, the journal continues, held hundreds who made Eclipse Day the occasion for an outing. The crowd was large enough that police had another concern. The Daily Journal writes that downtown police officers kept a sharp lookout for pickpockets during the eclipse. Many Portlanders forgot all about their pocketbooks and watches in their eagerness to watch the sun play hide-and-seek with the earth. But no one was caught in the act of slipping his hand into another's pocket while he was innocently gazing upward. The paper did report, however, that some children were disappointed. Ah, oh, I thought you was going to see something, was the common complaint of urchins, whose appreciation of the eclipse anticipated some sort of fireworks. You might wonder how people viewed an eclipse in 1918 without the eclipse lenses made of black polymer intended to protect vision. Various methods were described. The Daily Journal wrote, All sorts of eye shades were used to protect the eyes from the sun's rays in response to warnings of doctors. Amber and blue goggles, smoked glasses, celluloid eye shades, Kodak films, camera plates, and pieces of window pane smoked over a lamp were most generally used. The paper reported that hawkers selling smoked glass did a rushing business. One Portland officer had a glass pane coated with lamp black. 
The officer offered the glass to bystanders. As he offered to each curious observer, the Daily Journal reported, he issued instructions that the best view could be obtained by holding the glass against the face. The result was a blackened nose and forehead. Several Panama hats had to be sent to the cleaners. Not everyone heeded the doctor's advice, however. The Alma, Oklahoma Signal reported in July, H.L. Colburn, a farmer living near Stockton, was plowing while the eclipse was in order and repeatedly looked at the glaring sun. He soon noticed that his vision had become affected and that the following morning he was almost blind. And since that time, he's been under the care of an oculist, wearing darkened glasses continually. Still, the smoke glass appears to have been largely sufficient as such injuries were not widely reported. The weather was, of course, a concern. The Lamar, Colorado Register reported that while the astronomers who preferred to hang on to their small-town pleasures at Denver were standing idly last Saturday afternoon watching a lightning storm and seeing the moments for which they spent thousands of dollars in preparations being wasted, the citizens of Lamar vicinity were getting a beautiful and clear view of a wonderful total eclipse of the sun. In Portland, Siegel writes, while the moon slowly moved across the sun's disk, a mostly cloudless sky heralded great excitement for the team as many stars near the sun would have been visible under those conditions. But the duration of eclipse darkness was to last just barely two minutes, and with totality approaching, thin clouds began to cover the sun just prior to the critical moments where the sky grew dark. For about 15 minutes, including all of the totality, the sun was eclipsed not only by the moon, but by clouds as well. Not five minutes after it ended, the area surrounding the sun was completely clear again. Clouds had stymied the only team with the equipment necessary to test Einstein's theory. And that theory would remain untested and largely outside the public consciousness. That's not to say that science was not advanced. The Washington, D.C. Times Herald reported that a large number of excellent photographs and spectroscopic records of the solar corona, that is only visible during the brief moments of a total eclipse of the sun, were obtained. One unique image came from Howard Russell Butler, a physicist as well as an artist. Butler produced a colored image based on observation of the eclipse at its totality. The Princeton University Art Museum writes, at a time when photography could not yet capture the nuances of the eclipsed sun, Butler's paintings were a tour de force, providing astronomers and the public with perhaps the best record of an eclipse at the time. But what is perhaps most universal was the reaction of those who were there. Even in the midst of both a world war and the early throes of a global pandemic, the nation stopped and watched. The Daily Journal headline was, War Eclipsed by Feet of Moon in Shutting Out Sun, and Portland Drops Work and Play to View Great Natural Phenomenon. The Spokane Spokesman Review reported thousands dropped mundane activities to marvel at celestial phenomenon. The Champaign Daily News headline was, America Stops Work to Watch Eclipse. The Daily Journal wrote, Eclipsing even the grim light of war, the moon on Saturday afternoon served to bring to Portland people the astronomical treat of a lifetime. The Champaign Daily News wrote, Business halted, shop work ceased or lagged, in a wide path across the United States, from Florida to Washington. The Boise, Idaho statement wrote, From the appearance of the streets and community in general, one could almost imagine himself in an air-rated city of Europe. So interested was everyone in their... Skyward Gazing. Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity was finally tested when two teams went to see a solar eclipse on May 29, 1919. In the end, the evidence supported Einstein's theory, and when that was reported, Albert Einstein became a household name. To me, what's really most interesting about the way the nation responded to the eclipse in 1918 is how similar it is to the way that we're doing things today. The Washington Post reported two days ago that all the hotels are full, all the campgrounds are booked, that there's not a rental car available anywhere around the April 8th event. Officials in the state of Arkansas say that this might be the single biggest tourism event in the history of the state. And despite all the opportunities to study solar eclipses, NASA still has more to learn. They'll be sending up two sounding rockets to see how the Earth's upper atmosphere is affected by the eclipse. Archaeological evidence suggests that humans have been recording total solar eclipses for something around 5,000 years. And yet these events still grasp almost universally our interest. Having seen these four eons, we still do exactly what they did then. Stop whatever we're doing. Look up in the sky and wonder. Is there 
better evidence that despite all our differences, despite all of history, we are still merely human. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy. And if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community and locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. 